Okay, so thank you everyone. This is um, the panel session entitled uh, Regulatory Pathways to Commercialization and Where Do We Stand on This Journey? Um, my name's John Way. I'm the VP and Head of International Regulatory Sciences at Biogen, but with me, I have a panel who will be perfect for answering just that question. Um, with me today, I have um, from the EMA, uh, Dr. Anna Hildago-Simon, who is the Head of Advanced Therapies um, with, with, uh, with the European Medicines Agency. I have Dr. Peter Marks, who's the um, Director, Center of Biological Evaluation and Research with FDA. I have Dr. Yoshiaki Mariyama from the PMDA in Japan, who is the Review Director for the Office of Cellular and Tissue-Based Products. And then from the MHRA, I have Dr. Christian Schneider, who's Interim Chief uh, Scientific Officer currently and um, formerly the head of NIBSC. And we'll hear more about that from Christian uh, later. So. Um, Thank you to the panelists for agreeing to be part of this um, very inter interesting discussion of how the global regulatory environment is, being, is evolving to um, adapt to the needs to develop ATMPs in this complex area where there are requirements across the globe that do differ. Um, this is a unique opportunity to have these regulators together and I'd like to um, spend as much time as possible to hear the different perspectives, but also to see where there are points of harmonization and points of convergence where we can as drug developers um, come together and work in partnership to ensure that these complex medicines get to patients in the most efficient way possible. So. With that, um, I'd like to um, turn to the panelists and I'm gonna turn to Anna first, um, given the Mediterranean backdrop we have here, um, to, um, to talk a little bit about the EMA and, um, and some of the um, regulatory um, um, pathways that are available to ATMP um, um, uh, development and, um, and whether they are living up to the aspirations that were set out and whether there is more um, that can be done and the way the EMA are thinking about it. So over to you, Anna, thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to be here and good to be invited to, to be in that so interesting panel. Um, yes, the answer is that what we have is fit, but we are constantly evolving. And what we are finding now with ATMP is that we need to get uh, the maximum use of all the flexibilities that the system offer us. So we see that um, we cannot do things exactly the same way that we do for other therapies. So anytime that uh, as a developer, you are thinking that this is not going to fit in the system, then you need to talk to us because we have to make it fit. It's not going to be completely incompatible and it's not going to be completely compatible either. We are learning as we go along that science uh, moves very fast and we need to move with it. So we are finding in the last three or four or five years that these ATMPs that we look at 10 years ago were really dinosaurs comparing with how we have learned to fit them into the system and to use the best elements of this system to, to make it work. So yes to the evolution, yes to the harmonization. And regarding the tools, I'm just going to mention two. One of them is if you have a very, very early idea, the ITF, the Innovation Task Force, is probably the best first contact because you don't need to have enormous amount of data, but uh, if you have an idea, and especially if you're addressing an unmet medical need, then we will be very keen to talk to you to see how we can together direct this in the best direction. And the other one is the use of PRIME, the Priority Medicines Scheme, which uh, we have seen is already no specifically made for ATMP, but is suiting very, very well to ATMP. So we find that maybe very roughly they are about one quarter to one third of the submissions and nearly half of the success stories. And now that we are seeing the first uh, products who were designated prime two years ago came in to, to reality, to the marketing uh, authorization process, we can see that it's a very good way to partner with regulators earlier and try to steer everything in, in the best direction. But I imagine we will be talking about those schemes later on today. So, thing is here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I'm going to ask um, Peter um, if you would, wouldn't mind sharing some of the thinking around the FDA and some of the pathways that might be available there. So, over to you, Peter. Yeah. So, I, I think we've realize that 
we have to have uh, some special help for uh, ATMPs. So we put forward um, a, an additional pathway for interaction called the Interact Program uh, so that uh, ATMPs coming in or can come in early and have early discussions about the development programs. Um, we find that particularly in this space, having very early discussions, sometimes before any formal regulatory submission uh, has been made can be very helpful uh, because it eliminates some of the missteps that uh, can be made early on. Uh, so we really encourage people to use that. The other piece is uh, in 2016, towards the end of 2016, there was the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy uh, pathway that was passed by our Congress. And that gives, can, gives us the ability to designate products in the ATMP space as uh, really like breakthrough products. The standard is a little bit lower than required for a breakthrough small molecule drug or protein therapeutic, where you would have to be better than an existing standard of care. Here, it just has to have potential uh, effectiveness uh, and show evidence of possible clinical benefits. So those two things combined, I think, have been put in place and I think can really help people going about developing um, ATMPs in our space. Great, no, th thank you for that. Um, thank you for that, Peter. And um, I'm gonna move now to um, uh, Yoshiaki from the, um, the Japanese PMDA's perspective, if, if I may. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so in Japan, uh, to, uh, to, of 2014, uh, re regulatory framework for the digital medicine has been changed uh, to facilitate the patient access to uh, innovative medical product. So the uh, pharmaceutical medical device and other scientific uh, product act called PMD act uh, provides the option of the new pathway to obtain the conditional and time limited approval for regenerative medical product. So under the, this act, uh, the conditional and time limited approval scheme uh, so regenerated medical products are granted marketing authorization uh, when efficacy can be presumed. However, in order to the, uh, demonstrate efficacy within the granted time period, the maximum period is uh, seven years. So sponsor are subject to the uh, strict post-marketing study as a condition for approval. And, uh, and another um, uh, accelerated pathway co called the uh, Sakigake, which is uh, enabling the partnership between the applicant and regulator to deliver the product to a patient. Uh, started on the pilot basis on 2015, but now it was uh, enacted in 2020 under the PMD Act, and the name is a Pioneer Product Designation System. So yeah, that's a Japanese current situation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. And then, um, and then Christian, um, I'd love to hear how the MHRA are now approaching it um, now that um, you, you may also have a different position from the EMA's um, framework, so that. Thanks, John. Well, indeed, um, the UK has always had a strong ambition with advanced therapies, and we will continue to have that and um, to do it. Um, the UK is now taking an approach um, on alignment where needed, but obviously also innovating where possible. So it wouldn't make sense if we were to change the definitions on what an advanced therapy is. So there will be continuity, um, and ATMPs will be regulated nationally in relation um, to Great Britain by the MHRA according to the same principles that were previously applied. So there is a continuum there. Um, this opens the way for harmonization, for collaborative approaches between regulators, obviously for multinational clinical trials. Um, when it comes to what, what we are doing um, now is we have already worked closely with UK um, stakeholders. So for example, our innovation office has worked with the cell and gene therapy catapult to support various companies um, to manufacture. Um, manufacturing actually um, in, in the advanced therapy treatment center, this is a very important aspect in the UK and we've been involved 
myself there um, with staff also helping there, um, of, co of course, within our remit. And we have finally listened to, um, to companies, small companies, big pharma, academia, um, on how um, licensing should look like. And we have therefore developed an innovative licensing and access pathway, ILAP. Um, reimbursement, for example, is still an issue for advanced therapies. And obviously, we are involving the payers very early on in this. Um, um, so if there is time later, I can expand more on what this ILAP procedure actually encompasses. But it, it is open to everyone um, from every country. And it's also got an assessment component component in it. So obviously we've got early advice, uh, but sometimes you also have to look into data. So for example, when a small company or an academic group is launching a clinical trial um, and they ask themselves, will the dossier actually be fine for assessment um, um, and for submission, we can have um, a rapid uh, pre-assessment of that upfront before the submission so that everything goes well. So maybe I stop here, thanks. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Christian. And I think you've touched on a very interesting point around the um, the need for maybe broader stakeholder discussion as well at an early stage. I think the early interaction was raised, but also, it may also require a broad discussion. And, and I just wanted to open the question to the panel and perhaps to, to Anna, just in terms of you know, your views on how we should involve other stakeholders as well early in the process um, and maybe not just the regulator and, and the importance or not of doing that. Yeah, well, extremely important. And for AT&P more than for any other therapies, I will say. And um, the, the reason is because we are finding gaps at several stages, but the most obvious one is that when at and are in the market, the time period between it arrives to the clinic is longer than for other drugs, and we can measure that. But also we are finding that they are expensive, complicated to assess therapies, and the number of reimbursements and payers and involvement and willingness of the system to open the door to anybody who qualify is obviously restricted as well. So we have the two problems, the delay, and then the fact that even when they are acknowledged as a good thing and the patients that benefit are clearly identified, still not everybody gets in there. So we are finding that um, it's not good enough to ask company to have a post authorization data collection strategy that is only going to serve us because we are only a, a small part of, of the full process. The conversations are in two levels with the payers in Europe and with HDA bodies who do the assessment before the governments and the hospitals and the healthcare systems take the decisions. And we are finding that we have a lot to talk about it. Um, price is not in the remit of EMA because that will be decided at hospital level at certainly a national level, but the information required to make the decision is very much our responsibility. So early conversations with HDA's bodies and with uh, other bodies of that kind are available. The companies can come for a combined scientific advice. Uh, again, mixed taking, some companies think it's a better idea than others, but even if you are not involved in them directly yourself as a developer. You really need to think of their needs and put it together. And of course, the other thing that we are doing is aligning uh, from the moment of the first contact to say, okay, maybe the information that we require is very similar. And what we need to do is to agree how to collect it and how to present it. So it serves um, all of us, the needs for everybody. Um, we also have a further involvement with patients and healthcare professionals, but I think at the moment, the payers and the HCA bodies are the ones that is a great need to align and to talk with. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, and I was going to just um, have the opportunity for, for Peter to make any comments on that from your side and, and the FDA's point of view involving other stakeholders, patient groups, etc. cetera, in, in, in anything at this stage. Yeah, so I mean, I think we have benefited from the input of a variety of stakeholder groups, both um, industry groups um, like the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, um, where it's been helpful to get feedback on what's needed. Um, we've benefited from patient groups um, from hearing what uh, they've wanted uh, uh, to see in terms of us uh, helping uh, with the development programs. Um, it, it has been, it is a challenging uh, place here because we're struggling to bring things forward as quickly as we can in an area where the science is still struggling 
<laughs> to define the product sometimes. <laughs> so that's part of the challenge here. Yeah. Yeah, very, very true. And, um, and, and Yoshiaki, I, just from your, your point of view, I, you know, to understand a little bit about the PMDA and how, yeah. how PMD works with other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in the, P, the whole the PMDA, we are very good uh, relation uh, to the uh, our firm for the uh, industry uh, uh, forum for innovative medical regenerative medic medicine, I, uh, like ARM or the uh, US or EMA, and then we in the PMDA also just start to discussing to how to connect the patient group in during the consultation or review time. So yeah, now we are just starting this discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, no, thank you for that insight. And I, I don't know, Christine, if there's anything further you wanted to add at this point on, on the MHRA's um, interactions. Thanks. Well, well, obviously I mentioned the catapults, so this yeah. is a bit more local. Um, obviously industry associations, payers, um, I've mentioned these, but I'd like to highlight that patients are really at the center of what we do. Um, this is this is enshrined into the kind of revamped MHRA. And actually patients, especially for very orphan diseases, can help understanding what a clinical endpoint actually means, or we could actually go towards a patient reported outcome. There are treatments, as we all know, where there is no authorized treatment. If there is no authorized treatment, then there might be no authorized endpoint. And if there is no endpoint, it is difficult um, to, to show benefit, especially when it's so rare that you can't feasibly do a placebo controlled trial. So I think that the patients and also the healthcare providers for the local hospital sometimes even have to come into the discussion as well. It's not, it's not easy to organize, obviously, when you have the doctors as well. Um, but this is something that I think we, we all have to do so that we provide meaningful treatments. Yeah. No, I, I, I would yeah. like to ask something, John. Uh, the the ATMPs are also being especially good in this because um, the drive to involve more the patients is there and has been growing for a while. But with ATMPs, because it's so specific, because it's so frequently mm -hmm. rare disease, because they are suspensive and because they need to fit into a health system is already there. The involvement of the patients and healthcare professionals as well, patient has been very, very important. And I think they have, they're already helping to drive the, the field in the right direction. Thank you, thank you, Anna. No, that, I think there's, that's, that's, that's great, um, great alignment there in terms of the importance of, of, of the patient voice and what that can do to help further the understanding of what's important in terms of these development programs. Um, I want to turn a little bit to um, the way the regulatory sort of environment's shaping and around harmonization a little bit. And, you know, obviously with the four regulators here, you know, it's a great opportunity to talk about. There is a move, obviously, with, with different um, harmonized and, and, and work sharing initiatives happening on, on different fronts, that this is happening more and more. But I guess in the field of ATMP, there really is an opportunity here for there to be a harmonized global drug development approach. And I wanted to get at your views on how that can be done, not just within their, your agencies, but across agencies. And I just, just where those advantages could be and, and, and how you as, as regulators are looking at that. So um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm happy to go anywhere with that. Um, I don't know, I'll start with, maybe we'll start with Peter this time, if you're, if you're ready to answer. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's clear that, um, I, I think if we back up, it's clear that global regulatory harmonization is critical. I think that's what you're trying to get at here, right? Yeah. Um, that th this issue, um, particularly in the area of ATMPs that are targeted for small numbers of patients globally, um, or let, let's just say this, there, there are plenty of diseases that the, the patient population is so small in the United States that it's not commercially viable. It's so small in the European Union that it's not commercially viable. It's probably too small in the United Kingdom and too small in Japan. And yet when you collect them together, those patient populations, you have a perfectly viable product. The problem is that if a sponsor has to negotiate different regulatory environments in four different locations, that becomes untenable. If there are different requirements, if the, um, toxicology requirements don't match up if the manufacturing requirements don't match up. And so 
I think there's the opportunity here, particularly if we can find a way for these small populations to harmonize what we require, it may, it may make handling rare diseases easier um, to the extent that we actually see more diseases treated. And that actually would be useful for people you know, across all our countries, right? If we could uh, finally come around to having some of the rare uh, genetic diseases addressed, uh, for instance, with gene therapies or cell-based gene therapies, um, that benefit all of us. But right now we're not gonna get there um, because it's very hard to have commercial viability in one, in one location. And people are, are kind of scared about going uh, across uh, different uh, boundaries. So I think getting to some harmonization here uh, would be uh, very beneficial. Um, and whether we could do that in a way that it really focuses just on these smaller indications just to get our toe wet, um, maybe is, is a way to do this. Um, because we're not, talking, we're not talking about indications that have thousands of people. We're talking about indications that have 100 200 people globally maybe uh, treated a year. Um, and it's a shame that we can't get to a place where um, those people can have therapies that are potentially available right now um, because of the regulatory hurdles uh, that are at least perceived. Thank you for those thoughts, Peter. Um, I, I don't know if there is any other um, considerations around that, either from the sort of the UK's point of view, from Christian um, or Anna, if you have any additional thoughts. I mean, if, I, if it, yeah. so, thanks, thanks, John. If I, if I may, just just to fully support this, um, obviously, and I think that that now that we have. That, that we wanted all of us to work together in the in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think there are also other alliances, regulatory fora that we could use, explore using, um, um, so that we have a platform. Because I think that this is an excellent point. An ultra-orphan disease, you can never regulate this sufficiently in one jurisdiction. And and if indeed if there are different requirements, then there is there is indeed a problem. And and obviously the UK has now joined the Access Consortium, so with Australia, Canada, Singapore. Singapore, Switzerland. So that even goes further. So the more we can work and harmonize um, on, on these important treatments, um, the, the better it is. Thank you. And, 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 and Anna, I mean, if a, if, a, if a developer wanted to try and bring these sort of regulatory thoughts together, I mean, apart from going and meeting with every regulator separately, I mean, is there a, is there a kind of a, a forum by which we can bring regulators together under one development, under one discussion? Is, 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 that, is that at this stage something that's, that's, that's even possible? It's getting there. I mean, we talk more and more, and I will say that there is a, a lot of um, technical level conversations for at and um, Of course, we have our clusters and uh, uh, we have more invitees to discussions. And you may know that, uh, especially in Canada, Switzerland, and Richard, they, you, you find that the more we actually invite each other, the more benefit we get. Because at the end of the day, even though we are all asking for the same things, we want the drug to be good quality, safe, and effective, we all have to make it fit into a slightly different legislative system. So the, I will say the willingness to listen and to get together is certainly in a very good moment. The COVID has given us a little bit of a push in that direction as well, in, in the sense that I think we are co collaborating now more than we thought was possible to only a year ago. Mm -hmm. And the, the ultra rare are, for me, excellent as the first step. But anything that we gain in one area that we can prove first that we can do it, and second, that is good for the patients, then it's our role to push it to the next step forward. So um, let's just start with the obvious but let's make it together. We do talk and companies could actually do simultaneous um, conversations uh, between the FDA and EMA at least. So there are several areas and uh, if you want, you can have from the very beginning more of a open book between more than one regulators and try to, to get the thinking aligned. Once the thinking is aligned, every other step is easier. I can see Peter nodding. 
his his approval of that. But uh, the the companies can facilitate it for sure. I would just jump in and say that um, we uh, the reason why I was nodding is that I think that it's probably something we need to help make companies aware of that there's nothing that says that we at FDA can't have the EMA or any other regulator for that matter join in on one of our early regulatory calls with the company so that everyone is hearing the same thing. Um, and that way um, there can be alignment early on. It also helps us connect with other regulators early on um, so that we can align. And the more harmonization that happens early, then the less there is to do out back in terms of uncertainty. And I think a lot of this all boils down to reducing uncertainty for development in this rare disease space. Thank you for those thoughts. And, and Yoshiaki, I, I didn't want to leave you um, out of this discussion. If, if, if you had any other thoughts as well, please, please. Um. Well, uh, I'm fully uh, agree, <laughs> everybody. So maybe the Japan is a uh, uh, radar than the uh, EMA or uh, FDA to developing the uh, new product. But uh, for the, in Japan, the clinical data from the Japanese patient are required right now to marketing authorization in Japan. So I think the first step is not to be to miss the multi regional clinical trial. <laughs> you know? Yeah, need to the uh, data first. So, yeah, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you for that. So, I'm going to move. I'm going to move on to um, another area of flexibility. And and I think you know, Anna, you just alluded to this around the the COVID crisis and what we've seen um, from the regulators globally around the extreme flexibility that's been shown there. And 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 you know, and we. You know, we obviously commend the regulators and how they've, you know, adapted very quickly to, to, to this crisis. I think what is obviously headline grabbing is some of the, you know, the approvals and, and the rolling reviews and, you know, the fact that people are now in the public domain hearing of the regulatory agencies, which they may not have heard of before. But I think what we, what we also experienced is some flexibility behind the scenes around clinical trials and, 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 and the way the regulators actually, you know, worked very closely with developers to be very pragmatic about ensuring patients could still safely be um, participate in clinical trials and that continuity could continue. And I, I was, I was going to ask just Christian, if, 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 if you as a national regulator, you know, and, and, you know with, the, with the responsibility for clinical trials, can sort of comment on some of those flexibilities and, and whether they could be in the long term applied more broadly, especially around, you know, again, ATMP development and the flexibilities that may be needed there. Thanks. Well, indeed, that is that is a very um, important question, and I think what occurred to all of us in, in in the COVID crisis is that if if I am taking longer to do something to approve something, people will be waiting, people will get ill, and 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 so on. So um, this this I think was a mindset or has been a mindset for almost everyone on the planet, um, and maybe this is the mindset that we have to have, and I think that is also emerging that we have this also with other diseases. Um, we touched upon the ultra orphan diseases, for example, that's a small catastrophe, not small, but on a small scale with one person for that particular patient as well. And if we are not fast enough, then obviously that patient will also be waiting. So what, what we have done um, now for the COVID-19 clinical trials was very, very prioritized the rapid turnaround of clinical trial authorization within a few days. So um, this is possible if you put the right priorities um, into this. Um, rolling assessment, I think we are not alone in this, obviously EMA and, um, and FDA, and I guess also our Japanese colleagues. I think everyone has looked at, um, at rolling review, and that could, that could actually be um, a tool that we could use for other areas as well. So we will be doing this now, um, but obviously it's more resource intensive. So this is something which we also have to be aware of. Um, obviously, um, rapid scientific advice also on clinical trials. I mentioned the, the kind of informal pre pre-assessment of a dossier so that it really works out then when it's when it's arriving um, and so on. So I think regulatory flexibility, this, this, this is not just the MHRA. I think many regulators, if not all regulators, have had that. But th th there was just a few examples. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. 
And, and, and related to the um, experience and flexibility around um, the COVID crisis, and I don't think we could probably leave a panel discussion with regulators without mentioning the GMO topic. Um, the, um, so, so this is a question for Anna and Yoshiaki um, around any, any learnings or any op further opportunities to improve our, um, our situation around the GMO requirements. And again, um, you know, streamlining that um, and anything we, we saw from COVID, which may be applied uh, more broadly. I don't know, Anna, Anna, if you want to go first. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, well, we do have a problem with the harmonization of GMO treatments in, in Europe, and it's a problem that had been known for a while and of course affects all the GMOs uh, therapies. So what surprised me of the, the, the move from the commission and the system to really say, you know, for vaccines for COVID, this requirement gets off is how fast and how early in the problem it was. So that, that meant that uh, the awareness of this is something that is not quite working was there. Um, now the decision was taken to make it very limited. So it's, for vaccines, GMOs during the pandemic uh, crisis. So for ATMP, it will be ideal if this can be extended. And I imagine it will be a very close analysis of how it has worked, how it has re been received, if they really has caused any problem in any particular national competent authorities. And then we will learn from that. So the fact that we had it now for a year um, is is a good sign, and I think it will be it will be a good thing, but it will need to be assessed to see what are the pros and the cons. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And um, and and are you aware of any of any assessment or any plans for that assessment um, at the moment? Just as an as an insight into that, in any way that we can help and in, 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 in providing any information ourselves on that. Uh, not a word directly because it's probably too too early. Um, but um, also, they didn't know if there was going to be any vaccine who was going to be a GMO. So it was a little bit of a carte blanche for a need. Um, so they will be looking into it. When this is coming, it will require a change on the current system. So I'm sure there will be consultation where the stakeholders will, will be able to put their, their views forward. Great. And Yoshiaki, I mean, obviously the GMO topic is, is a big one for Japan as well. So it would be interesting to get your point of view on that as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, for the, in Japan, the, uh, the, uh, the act of the com conservation and sustainable uh, use of uh, biology diversity through regulations on the use of living modified uh, organisms. LMOs that's called uh, Cartagena Act was uh, enacted in 2003. So uh, if a uh, fan use their uh, bio vector, such as uh, adeno associated bio vector at the medical institution, uh, it's necessary to obtain the approval to use uh, GMOs by uh, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. Uh, before start of the clinical trial. So that act uh, seems like a barrier when starting to the clinical trial in Japan with uh, products that are uh, being developed uh, overseas. Uh, for the example in Japan, if uh, Japan joined to the multi-regional clinical trial later, uh, there is a risk that uh, time for the Japanese inclusion will be uh, missed uh, due to the review, the use of the GMOs. But uh, uh, in that response to this, uh, PMD has uh, set a new consultation menu to related uh, Cartagena Act uh, last year. So to prepare it, uh, application uh, two applications, a uh, biological diversity risk assessment report, uh, including the uh, risk assessment for the third party and a uh, protocol for uh, how to use it. So I don't think uh, uh, it is, I do not think 
that uh, it's not it is a difficult task uh, once they have the company have uh, experienced it. So yeah, and then the harmonization for the uh, requirement for the DMO is a good thing, but uh, uh, carefully uh, discussed uh, in the, the increasing the revision of the Calda DNA Act is necessary in Japan. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you, Yoshiaki. That's very, it's, it's very good to know there is some thoughts around that. And, you know, but I think as you maybe alluded, early, early, early discussion, early engagement is obviously key um, there. Okay, um, I'm going to move on. And, um, and, and Christian, um, we talked a little bit about um, the role of the um, UK's NIBSC um, as part of your, your remit. And, um, and I wondered if you could perhaps allude to a little bit of the sort of international aspects of, of, of that um, while we, you know, we have the opportunity to have you here. Oh, thanks. Well, so, so <laughs> just, just to explain, um, NIBSC is the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control, but it is pretty much an international institute. It's part of the agency. Um, it is um, working very closely with the World Health Organization, WHO, um, and is, in, in is, is, is a reference um, lab for creating um, international standards. So the definition of what an international unit is, for example, or for companies helping to develop vaccines um, or any other um, medicines um, is ideally standardized. So when you compare um, across clinical trials, for example, and you use different assays that are calibrated against an in-house assay, you can't compare is it, if it is an immune response against a monoclonal antibody, for example, or if it is the immune response now in COVID-19 vaccines, um, how would you be able to compare? And this could actually be um, a practical solution also to um, the, the, the harmonization approaches that we have discussed. Because if you have to, to measure some metabolites or whatever it is um, across the world in ultra orphan indications, you better harmonize that well. Um, so this is why NIBSC has a division of advanced therapies, um, um, has been working on, on reference reagents, like for example, for lentiviral vector integration, CD34 positive flow cytometry standards, mesenchymal stem cell standards. So basically those um, which are the frequently used products, you could say, so that helps then setting the gates in flow cytometry so that there is um, um, a better standardization on, 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 on the assay um, system. Um, um, just very briefly, um, uh, NIBSC is also the home of the UK Stem Cell Bank. Again, this is pretty much of an international asset if you want. So it's open for anyone to buy um, um, embryonic stem cells. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, we host more than half of the world's embryonic stem cell lines that, of course, there is um, different requirements and ethical considerations across all jurisdictions. Um, but if a company decides to differentiate those for a, into a medicinal product, it's, it's ideal, of course, to have a quality assured um, starting material. And this is what can be offered also with um, all the information that's required. So it's, this is not um, to advertise, but just to say that what is important is that you have a certain set of standardization activities and, and the Institute um, is, is part of this. We are now moving um, much more into um, a, a commonality also with the, regula the regulatory colleagues, because obviously that is that can be part of um, assuring the quality of advanced therapies, um, and we are working on this. Thanks, John. Uh, appreciate it, Christian. Yeah, that's 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 nice, and, and as you say, it's another another avenue for harmonisation, which I think, or or at least, um, you know. Um, just you know, cross cross regional discussion. So, um, we're coming to the end of the panel discussion, and I think it would be nice if we could hear from each of each of you um, on some sort of key takeaways from your wealth of experience to medicines developers, sponsors, in terms of some of the pitfalls, challenges, and just what do, what do you, what would be your piece of advice to to, to that community of developers? from all the experience you've seen and the bottlenecks and pitfalls you've come across so far. So um, let's let's start with Anna, Anna first. So if I can ask oh. you, Anna, to get your thoughts. Thank you, I get the first pick then. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to go back to this idea that um, you, you need to think that you don't want your drug in the market, you want your drug in the patient. And that requires that what happened after the marketing authorization is equally important and you cannot wait until you are there to, to plan it. 
So start thinking of what is the generation, the evidence that you need, and how are you going to get it from as early on as you can. And that applies even if you're a large farmer or a very, very small developer, because you have to take it for granted. By the time you arrive to marketing authorization, if you have a drug that really works, you're going to have still a lot of uncertainties around. And it's still maybe worth putting your drug out there because some people will clearly benefit. That is very clear with ATMPs, with the one-off treatment that can solve many things and the, the approach to get unmet medical needs. So start thinking about the um, evidence generation as early as you can and plan and develop with that in mind. And then you will be considered also all the other stakeholders that we had discussed before. Thank you, Anna. Um, Peter, can I can I get your thoughts next? Yeah, you know, I'm just going to I'm going to build off of Anna's uh, comments and just go earlier, which is that I would say that that before you launch off too far in this space of advanced uh, medicinal product development, really one has to think about having success early on. And what we see all too often are people doing clinical trials with a product that is uh, made by some prototype manufacturing process. And then they go to move to the definitive manufacturing process and they're not able to get comparability. And then they end up having to repeat themselves. I would say plan for success. It's painful, I know, to invest the extra effort in the right manufacturing early on and the right quality controls early on. But it's absolutely worth it. Find the critical quality attributes, find the manufacturing process that works early on and use it. Thank you, Peter. And um, Yoshiaki, um, what, 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 what can you offer to us? Yeah, we are uh, very really, uh, struggle for the, uh, how to uh, determine the efficacy in small subjects and how to demonstrate efficacy and the safety on post-marketing phase. So, uh, you know, now we are just talking about the uh, uh, review for the uh, real world data or real world evidence for the, in this field. Yeah, but uh, we don't know that right now. We don't have a, a, any answer yet. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And, um, and, and, and Christian, I'll give you the final, final word on this. Thanks. Well, my, my advice is talk, talk, talk. Use the interaction with the regulators as a strategic tool. Um, you will get valuable insight because regulators will have seen a lot of different um, medicines. Um, and, and that can also trigger um, scientific and regulatory thinking as, as Anna, Peter and um, um, uh, alluded for, uh, earlier. It is, it is very important that we move our regulatory framework um, and that we are, find um, answers um, to questions that we cannot answer for now. And of course, the other one is make use of regulatory tools. They are there for you. Use them. Certification from the EMA, for example, use it. It, it, it is valuable um, to do it. And, and, and I have the impression that sometimes companies do not uh, know how to use them optimally, but it makes perfect sense to do it. Well, and so thank you so much for those insights. Um, I mean, this has been a very, very valuable discussion between the four of you. I think it's great. I mean, my takeaways from this is there is an openness, there is a flexibility both within each of these, each of your territories. But I think just hearing hearing the discussion, earlier discussion, bring problems to the table. If there is a need for bringing regulators together, actually, it seems like at least the conversation can happen. Don't be afraid to ask. And, um, and, and, and we're all here to do one thing, and that's to bring the medicines to patients as quickly and as, as seamlessly as possible. So I thank you all ever so much for this um, exciting panel discussion. And I'm sure we'll have lots of questions um, during and, and, um, and, 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 um, and, and afterwards. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.